most wonderful stories in the Bible is the story of Noah and the ark, an account of a truly great man whose faith in God never wavered, in spite of the almost incredible task of building a monster houseboat that was called the ark. This was to house not only Noah and his family, but also the most incredible collection of animals the world has ever known. For you see, God had grown very tired of man whom he had created, and who was far from the image God had in mind when he created him. For every kind of evil that could possibly be imagined, he savoured to the full. For as God said to Noah, there is evil in his heart continually, and I will destroy man whom I've created, and with him all life that is on the earth. But because you are a just and upright man, I will spare you and your wife, your sons and their wives. Therefore, make an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in stories, upper, middle and lower, and you shall bring into the ark with you two of every living thing that has the breath of life. And they shall be male and female, in order that they may be spared from the floods which I shall bring upon the earth. Make a door in the side of the ark and a window in the roof. And Noah did as God commanded. He built an enormous houseboat with a roof and a window and a tremendous door which he set in the side of the ark so that it could be lowered to admit the host of animals as they arrived. Two of every living creature went into the ark with Noah and his family. You can imagine what a mammoth task it must have been. It was, but an even greater one when he had to collect the host of animals. So they began to arrive. Two by two they came, a multitude of crowding birds and beasts drawn on by some great urgency to the ark. The eaters of grass and those who preyed upon the grass eaters. But it seemed that some strange truce was with them, for the eagle flew in above the hair. The leopard padded softly beside the blundering warthog. And the hawk came with a dove and the lion came with a lamb each giving tongue in its own peculiar manner until the air was filled with the sound of their voices. came with different and uncertain steps, its big eyes full of bewilderment. It paused at the foot of the big door, hesitated, and then as Noah called encouragement, it came forward shyly, talking with its mate in deep throaty tones. <coughs> pink and grey feathers fluffed out in anger, screamed at each new arrival, and then, as if fearful of being left behind, it flew swift-winged into the ark. The bell bird called endlessly as if its voice was so necessary to summon those who still came from the distance. The poor sea lion, so bewildered by the great mass of crowding animals, flopped along beside its mate. He tried to make way for her, but the others pushed him away. So as soon as they reached the entrance to the ark, he barked his protests to Noah. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, 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 uh. Then came the fox and his mate, the vixen. Like a pair of brown ghosts, they glided up the great ramp. And as they entered the ark, they greeted Noah, each in its own way. A 
pair of squirrels for whom the forest was home scampered up the gangway for a few yards, and then, nervous at the press of the larger beasts, they ran back again, until one of them jumped upon the broad back of the donkey and was joined by the other, and in triumph they rode into the ark, chattering merrily. The camels came with much disdainful contempt for the other animals, and showing their big yellow teeth, they groaned in answer to Noah, who called out a greeting. As the big hippopotamus and his mate ambled up towards the ark, there was no room for any other creatures. And Noah called out to them to hurry. But with lowered heads and big mouths wide open, they roared their protests. <coughs> the bear and his mate held a noisy conversation below the ark. She whined and complained and he seemed to be trying to explain why it was necessary for them to enter the ark. The lion waited, his wonderful eyes searching the vast plains ahead. Like a statue he stood, until from the long grass in the distance came the lioness and he went to meet her. And together they made their way towards the ark. With great arrogance and conscious of his enormous strength, he powered his way through the ranks of the smaller creatures and snarled at the slow-moving tortoise and turtle. <coughs> the buzzard glided overhead against the dark gray of the sky, and it seemed for a while that it would never come down. And then with a long, thin cry, closed its wings and dropped like a stone towards the ark. The tiger came with long cat-like strides. It padded beside its mate, and then as they slipped over the entrance to the ark, he looked back, and in his eyes was all the longing for sun-dappled jungles. But he only saw the masses of crowding animals behind. And so with a series of moaning roars, followed his beautiful mate into the ark. <coughs> Amidst the hordes of animals was much beauty, both winged and furred. The giraffe, the leopard, the kingfisher, the zebra, and the peacock, whose long trail of feathers was sorely tried by those pressing behind him. So he flew onto the roof of the ark to wait until the pressure eased. Meanwhile, he screamed a protest. <coughs> Beneath the darkening sky, a skylark hovered a snatch of melody falling from its wide-open beak, just a tiny speck of brown, and then closing its wings, it came swiftly to the outstretched hands of the waiting Noah. The dove came swiftly with grey wings jerking in flight, and then, as if it knew of the importance of its arrival, it flew onto Noah's shoulder, calling softly. Two great swans came out of the distance, wonderfully white against the leaden sky, and they made for the ark. No sound came from their throats, but the measured beat of their great wings was like music to Noah. <coughs> On 
on and on they came in a never-ending swarm of fur and feather. Two of every living creature, the greatest collection of animals the world has ever known. To protect them, not to destroy them. The wild birds joined together in songs of praise. They crowded the ark from floor to ceiling, and wherever they could perch, they settled. And their melody was such that Noah lifted his eyes to heaven and thanked God for his mercy. The sky grew darker by the minute. Enormous low clouds that were black in their dense packed masses. Noah watched the heavens. He searched them for any late arrivals amongst the birds. But apart from the black mass clouds, the skies were empty. He searched the great plains far ahead. Nothing showed. The woodland stood stark and green against the lowering clouds. But no animal could be seen. This then, thought Noah, is a complete total, and we must seal the ark against the floods to come. Then, just as he lifted his hand to signal to his sons to pull up the great door into the side of the ark, he saw a plume of dust looking strangely white and growing fast like a tree in the distance. Hold! cried Noah, and the huge door shuddered back to the ground. The dust cloud grew larger and larger with every passing minute until a monstrous voice sounded from the center of the dust. <coughs> Noah smote his head. The elephant and his wife, he cried. How could I possibly forgotten them? And the great voice sounded again. <coughs> then the huge beast arrived. They thundered past Noah and went into the ark sounding their greetings, as if they were happy that they had not been left behind. The ark, with its huge supports of wood holding it upright, was now sealed. Noah and his family waited the coming of the flood. It came slowly at first, Great drops of water as big as oranges that splattered against the roof of the ark. And then as the sky opened its floodgates, the torrents came down like a great sea. And it drummed on the ark like numberless thundering feet until the wild geese began to complain with heart hunger for moonlit marshes. For the tearing torrent was like a clarion call to them. And Noah's heart ached for their distress. The black skies poured their deluge with unending force. A torrent such as the earth had never known. The lakes and the rivers overflowed and joined together in one great rush to the seas. The underground rivers, the fountains of the deep, swelled until they burst through and the waters became one vast ocean which covered the earth. Nothing moved save the pouring waters and the dark shining sea. And the ark with its incredible family was lifted and it floated as if it were no more than a great cork. But once afloat, it spun round and round in mad circles and the animal clamour almost crowded out the vast roar of the falling waters. <coughs> It rained without stopping for 40 days and 40 nights. The unending sound of the deluge drove Noah and his family almost frantic. When the ark had at last began to slow down in its mad circles, and most of the animals, tired from their efforts, began to sleep, the wolf, whom nothing could pacify, still lifted its grey muzzle, and the infinite sadness of its howling echoed through the long corridors of the ark. And then one night,
night, just before dawn, there came a silence that was almost unbelievable. The rains had stopped. Noah lifted his hands and he said, The rain is no more. God has remembered his promise to his servant. And amidst the silence, he prayed, his faith in God greater than ever before. The waves chuckled and slapped against the ark, and then, as Noah lifted his head after his prayer, there came a song which against the silence was almost unbearable. The first notes were long and thin, but they grew deeper and stronger until they filled the ark with their sound. And Noah bent his head to listen whilst a nightingale sang. Long after the nightingale had finished singing, Noah just stood praising God for his mercy. Then he said, I will go to the roof and open the window. But it was still dark when he did so. But the sky was just clearing before the new day. A great moon lifted its bronze face over the sea and climbed steadily through the thinning clouds to gaze with cold indifference upon its reflection on the lonely floating ark. The night moved on. The moon passed over and set as big and as bronze as when she rose out of the sea. And then, as if by some strange signal, the animal clamour began again. The lion roared for sun-baked plains. The leopard for dappled forests. The doves for cool woodlands. The chimpanzee had no such longings. He stamped his feet and he barked his displeasure. The silent hour before the dawn was shattered. The watchful dark waters took the sounds and echoed them until it seemed that heaven must surely hear. Long after the moon had gone, the black night was unbroken. From the arc to eternity, it seemed, there was no horizon. Nothing showed but a great blanket of darkness. And then, like a miracle to Noah and his family, came the first tremble of the new day. It was grey at first, but within a minute or two it changed to pink and primrose of delicate colours. The sea came alive with a million reflections, but the vast family of animals slept worn out by their grief and fears. Only Noah and his family saw the miracle of the rainbow. The rooster, though it could not see the new day, somehow seemed to know that the long dark night and the rains were ended. Later that day, Noah sent forth the raven. The big black bird flew with its wings as yet, not quite used to the long time without flight. But soon it became a speck in the distance, and its bark of freedom came over the waters to where Noah waited. The raven did not return, so Noah sent out the dove, and it swiftly returned, for nowhere in the world of water was there anywhere for her to perch. After seven days, he again sent out the dove, and the little grey bird winged its way over the dancing waters, and for a long time was lost to Noah. Time and again he went to the window to look for her, and just as he was ready to think that she would no longer return, he heard her crooning song coming from the roof, and he stretched forth his hand, and the dove came willingly to him, calling softly.
Noah rejoiced and thanked God that the floods were going down, for in the beak of the little dove was a sprig of olive. And yet another week passed, and Noah opened the window and gave the dove her freedom. This time she flew on and on to disappear, and she did not return. Noah then removed the covering from the ark, and God spake to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark with your wife and your sons and their wives, and bring forth every living thing that is with you, both of cattle and wild creatures and the fowls of the air, and of every creeping thing that they may go free and multiply abundantly on the earth. And then Noah gave the order to his sons to lower the great door from the side of the ark. And as it fell slowly to the rocky ground, the great family of animals seemed to know that freedom was theirs. They poured out into the clear, cold air of a lovely morning and in one enormous tide of living flesh went down and spread out into the plains. And the valleys and the hills echoed with the sounds of their joy. The birds perched on the roof of the ark and on every rock that could provide a perch for their feet. And then, as if at a given signal, they flew. And the air throbbed with the noise of their wings and their voices. It was as if creation had begun all over again. And to this mighty chorus, Noah added his voice. He thanked God for his mercy that so many were spared to start life again in a sweetened and cleansed earth. And the Lord said in his heart, I will never again destroy the life on earth for man's sake. For evil is in his heart and in his mind, and it stems from his imagination. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. It was a lovely spring morning. Winter had long since taken her last icy breath, and all the black and the brown of her decay had been drawn beneath the earth to feed the young green of the new season. Oh, and the birds were busy, busy with nesting and singing, and as for the robin, well, he was like a red leaf in the trees, and when he sang, his song was like a handful of jingling silver. And the rooks and the jackdaws seemed to be suddenly amiable and talked to each other across the tops of the trees. The tide of life had turned. The grass was bright green, with little white flowers that nodded like the happy faces of little children. On the hedgerows, catkins hung like little yellow socks hanging up to dry. And the early bees sang quiet approval at this storehouse of pollen. The dew gathered like glass berries at the tips of each twig, and the sunlight gave each one a bright sparkle which was winked back by way of reflection. And the missile thrush, his heart bright with joy, sent his song down the hill toward the city. A spider, with endless patience, swung to and fro on a silken thread, and in the space of an hour or so, she'd crocheted a shining wonder of a web and hung it over a thorn tree. The sky was a great bowl of blue in which floated a wedge of fleecy white clouds like an approaching flock of sheep. And below this, a skylark hovered and sang his little heart out.
a blackbird was fluting a quiet solo and the echoes played it back to him. You would have thought that at this moment mankind was kneeling to thank God for such a lovely day. But you'd have been so wrong. For below the hill, the gate and a multitude of people swarmed out and began to climb the hill. You could see by the expression on their faces that prayer was the last thing in their hearts that lovely morning. They came not to pray, but to destroy. For in their midst, a man staggered beneath the burden of a great wooden cross and he fell to his knees several times and each time he fell, they jeered at him. Those nearest to him struck him with their fists and those who couldn't reach him to do this spat at him. And on this lovely spring morning, human hate engulfed him. The birds hushed their singing and the blackbird flew away with loud alarm cries. The little spider, sensing danger, sat still in her web. And then, as the mob reached the top of the hill, there came a yell of triumphant derision as a soldier with rock-hard hands had fashioned a crown of thorns which he had torn from the tree. And with great brutality, rammed it upon the head of the exhausted Jesus. A crown of thorns from which floated the quivering threads of a spider's craft. The mob was crazy with brutal laughter and hate. They tore his garments from his body and without an ounce of pity, they nailed him hand and foot to the cross. And then with a savage yell of hatred, they erected the cross with its human burden. To try to breathe in such a situation must have been terrible for with ribs that arched and fought to provide air for his tortured lungs, he, he used this hard-won oxygen to ask for forgiveness for those who tortured him so. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Those who stood nearby imagined that Jesus prayed for deliverance, and with fear in their hearts, they waited for the miracle. And when it didn't come, they screamed their mockery until it seemed the whole world had gone mad. On each side of Jesus was a similar cross, and from each a victim hung in torment. One of these turned his head to Jesus and he gasped, If you're this son of God, this miracle worker, why don't you work a miracle? and save us and yourself. But the other victim rebuked him and he said, you don't know what you ask. Here you're in the presence of a truly great man. And turning his head to Jesus, he said, Lord, think of me when you will come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And in the midst of throbbing new life, that lovely spring morning, the most splendid man the world has ever known, lifted his head and he cried, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And his head with its ghastly crown of mockery drooped, and life with all its agony left him. A silence fell upon the multitude, a silence during which a dove called over and over again, Lord, 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 Lord. The sky grew dark and yet there were no clouds, and the light of the sun was as weak as a candle flame. 
and the silence of the crowd after the hysteria of hate could almost be felt. The guilt strode abroad that lovely morning. And the only sounds came from the soldiers who bartered for the robes of Jesus. The first day of the week following the crucifixion, it seemed that nature, outraged by the horror of the previous week, now strove to cover the scars. The buds broke through their brown casings and a million tiny green leaves draped the garden with an emerald mist. And a throstle came brown-winged to an olive tree and sanity came back to the garden. The garden rang with the voices of many wild birds. The hoopoe. The nuthatch. And a tree creeper. Then came Mary Magdalene to kneel at the burial place of Jesus. And though it was still early and the light dim, she could see that the big stone had been rolled away and that the body of Jesus was not there. Only the white bindings with which his body had been wrapped lay in a heap upon the ground. And with fear in her heart, she ran through the garden to find Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved. They hurried together towards the sepulchre. But Mary, Mary sped ahead of them like a hunted deer. And arriving at the sepulchre, she rocked to and fro in her grief. And through the dimming veil of her tears, she saw two figures kneeling there. One at the foot and the other at the head of where the body of Jesus had been. Mary's grief now verged upon hysteria, so much so that... One of the kneeling figures turned to her and he said, Why do you weep, woman? Because they've taken away my Lord and I know not where they've hidden him, replied Mary. Just then a small blue-grey dove began to call, and to the disordered mind of Mary it seemed that this dove said over and over again, Oh, look, oh, look, oh, look. Mary turned to look behind her, and she saw Jesus standing there. But because of her distress, she thought him one of the gardeners. And when he asked her, Whom do you seek? Why do you weep? Oh, sir, replied Mary, if you've taken him away, please tell me where you've put him, and I'll take him away. Jesus just looked at her, and he said, Mary. And at once she recognized him, with her heart almost bursting with emotion, she whispered, Master. Then said Jesus, go and call my brethren, and tell them that soon I must ascend to my father. Like little children they came, full of wonder and doubt, in spite of the evidence of their eyes. So much so that Thomas was openly stating, Unless I can see the wounds in his hands and his feet and the spear thrust in his side, I'll never believe that it can be Jesus. When they came and stood before Jesus, he gently rebuked them and he said, Now you believe, but only because you can see. But I tell you that there will be others who will not be able to see, but because of their faith, they will believe. You know, this is surely a reminder of those of today who are the doubting Thomases. For we who live in an age where miracles seem commonplace often seek to cast doubt about a miracle because it was so long ago. Yet no modern miracle lasts longer than its few days of wonder. 
For yesterday, man walked on the moon, and today it is old hat. But the wonder of this man, Jesus Christ, is as fresh and as eternal as a spring morning. This is a story of the time of the harvest. It's a wonderful time of the year to use our eyes as well as our ears. For although spring and summer have passed, there's much of beauty still to see and to hear. For one thing, quite a few wild birds are still singing, in spite of the fact that soon they will be flying to warmer countries. It's true, of course, that many of the famous voices are now silent. The nightingale, blackbird, thrush, white throat and others. But along the harvest lanes and the tall trees, we can still hear those gentle little songs from the chiff chaff and the willow warbler. If ever there could be echoes of spring during harvest time, these most surely are the ones. The willow warbler with a song that warbles gently down the scale to die away in a murmur. The chiff chaff hasn't the same gentle tones, but a constant reminder of its own name, chiff chaff. Quite a number of bird voices at this time are those of the ground nesting birds, such as the corncrake, another who very shortly will be flying to spend the winter in a warmer country. You know, it's very easy to understand why we call it the corncrake. Then we have the quail, no larger than the thrush, with a sharp little call of three notes, as if the quail were thirsty and called for someone to wet my lips. One thing we can be certain about is that the seasons never last long enough for us to grow weary of them. For each season is part of God's great plan. After summer, the blossoms fade and give way to the infant fruit that is pushing its way into the world. The petals fall and lie in the roads and lanes like so much confetti. And then the rains come and the story unfolds again because other blossoms begin to show. You know, poppies like little people in their gay bonnets. The toad flax with blossoms like big yellow tadpoles and their leaves just like the leaves of flax. The silver weed with lovely buttercup-like blossoms and leaves that gleam with a sheen of silver. And there's the tall buckwheat, which in spite of its name is not a bit like the wheat in the harvest fields. The brambles, on the other hand, will have fruit and blossoms. So the bees, the wasps and the big flies have a choice of fruit juices or nectar. And they sing their songs of praise. Although I suppose one could call them their harvest hymns. Those big birds of the fields, the peewits. Isn't it strange? A few weeks ago they wouldn't have tolerated each other as neighbours. And now they haunt the fields, sharing a weep with each other. <coughs> These harvest mornings are sometimes so still, you're certain that God is there with you. And under the cooling earth, the mists of morning lift so slowly. But when the sun breaks through their ranks between the trees, the scene is like those lofty aisles in some great cathedral. And there's no moment like it throughout the year. For it seems that great but gentle hands have been placed upon your head. And out of the mists a voice seems to say, Be still and know that I am with you. 
It's a moment to remember all your lives. And you know, these harvest days can be so beautiful, with spider webs hung over the hawthorn hedges like fairy necklaces. And then in the short grass on the heathlands, you'll find other webs, but these are like little hammocks of mist. <laughs> and then, most likely, the pheasant in his Joseph's coat of many colours, flying across the fields and calling out at the top of his voice. <laughs> in village church as well as in cathedral, people gather to thank God for the harvest. The colours of the flower and the fruit are as lovely as the gorgeous colours in the stained glass windows. Choirs will sing the harvest hymns, and especially the children's hymn. All things bright and beautiful. All creatures great and small. We then think of the tiny harvest mouse, whose voice is only a whisper of a sound. And the mighty red deer stag, whose great voice echoes across the mountain moorlands. The bright and the beautiful. The hedge barrow, whose bright little song is so welcome now that the famous voices are hushed. The kingfisher has only a few piping notes, but his beauty is so great we hardly notice that his voice is weak. Each little flower that opens, each little bird that sings. We see in a countryside as bright with wild flowers and bird song as the village church is bright with harvest gifts and the voices of children. For this is the time of the harvest, when mankind reaps what he has sown in the fields and brings with bared head some of the fruits to enrich a village church. The skill of the baker with the bronzed baked loaves. The produce of the small holding. And the evidence of the farmer's labour. And grey heads bend in prayer along with those of youth. The barley and the wheat have fallen before the combine harvester. And like Ruth, the wild creatures have done their gleaning. Yet, you know, the seed time is only an improved time. For long before men took the early grasses and cultivated them, God had placed them there for his use. This is God's way even today. For man's mind, his creative instincts are God-given. Something which in his time must reach the harvest. Meanwhile, let us go on through the avenue of the years, the pattern of the seasons. But above all, let us be certain that the fruits of our minds and our labours are worthy of the harvest to come so that he may say to each and every one of us, Well done, good and faithful servant. <laughs>